Uh, first of all, to uh, Chairman Jay LaPere, to uh, CEO Jennifer Grossman, Jay, for uh, bringing me to the Atlas Society. I have been absolutely delighted to work with the great team for the last, is it going on three or four years now? Time flies. Uh, my topic today is capitalism, the premier habitat for humanity. And that phrase might strike you in a different context for a different reason. That's why I used it. <laughs> I've been using it for a while, and it's in my book. But uh, that's what we'll discuss. And now I know it's early, but here's the first quiz question. Students, does anyone want to answer this one? What comes to mind when you see this uh, picture? Any particular phrase? Fish out of water. Not just the fish, but sometimes people traveling in different countries and different, I felt like a fish out of water. <clears throat> Something bad is going to happen to that fish, probably. Looks happy at this point, though. A very uh, ambitious fish. Now, um, there are saltwater fish and free water, freshwater fish. So even if they're in water, uh, make sure they're in the right type of water. This is a vibrant habitat. But uh, too much salt? I think that's called the Dead Sea. Hmm. Death, not life. Different habitat. Well, it's likewise for humans. We too have an optimal habitat. We too are a living organism. I don't know where this hitchhiker is standing. I think the moon, but that's, I, I love that picture. Clearly wants to get home. Uh, so we need a human habitat, and not just to survive, uh, but to live well, which means flourishing. This is interesting because this is um, below the sea. You recently saw the Titan explosion, a submersible trying to go down to see the Titanic. Very clever, very interesting, but it didn't work. And immediate death. Wow, you need the right habitat. Look at all the equipment. Now, humans are bad for the environment, we're told. It's a very common expression. Here's a very angry young lady, the famous Greta Thunberg. Time magazine put her on the person of the year. I think this is, forget what year this is, four or five years ago. Emotion, not reason. But here's my question. What is the the? Every time you hear this, make sure you focus on the the. What, what do you mean the environment? <clears throat> well, just if you go for synonyms and just tool around a little bit, you'll, what is the environment, dictionaries. And, I, I find these kind of concepts, surroundings, environs, well, environs, it's like environment, a context of some kind, a habitat, a living area, an ecosystem. I promised Professor Hicks I'd have ecosystem in there. He just asked me about that, nature. So let me, though, focus on one of them, habitat. Well, in the dictionary it says, the natural home or environment of an animal, plant, or other organism. Well, okay, the most obvious other organism might be the human organism, but okay, whatever, other. But that must include humans, right? A na okay, so a natural home or environment for humans? Well, hospitable, but not all parts of it. Relatively unhospitable. Well, until we went there, but we had to bring all this equipment. My favorite is the Rover. This is such an American thing, like go up there with a car and drive around and see things. But even under the ocean, lots of protection, lots of an environment created to survive under high pressure in the ocean. Why did I put those there? Football helmets? It's not really natural to go out in the world and butt heads with people and break your skull. 
So let's put on some helmets and really enjoy this and survive. But there's a theme I'm going to come back to later, which is headgear, head protection. It's really what these things are, right? These helmets in all these various contexts. Something about the human head needs a special habitat. What could that be? I show this to students sometimes when we're talking about environmentalism. And I'll say, which system is better? And I always remind them, better by what standard? You can't just say, good or better. You need a standard. Is it prosperity? Is it life? Is it longevity? Now, on the principle of carbon footprint, North Korea is superior. Because there's no footprint. There's no electricity. There's no... So it's the better system. But if you care about human well-being, survival, and sorry, you might want some electricity. That's all the lights. That's uh, Seoul. I don't think you can find Pyongyang, capital of North Korea. At least not, well, there's a little spot there. So just on that kind of imagery, wow. There is um, a peninsula occupied by the same kind of people, but a different political economic system. And one looks somewhat inhabitable, like the moon. Detroit, if you look on the internet, Detroit before and after, it's very, very disheartening. Detroit, you know, when the cars were dominating the city. Before and after, looks like a war zone here. The train station. The Michigan Central Station uh, in 1923, and then what it is now. The famous United Artists Movie Theater. Look at the opulence on the left and decay. Now, all industries rise and fall. We're not expecting um, you know, things to be preserved forever. Industries change. But, but nothing to be done with this, nothing to be refurbished, nothing to be torn down with something new. Why is it still there? No motivation to improve it, change it. Now, there is a place where there's no climate change. This is the ideal of the environmentalist. But it's indoors. It's called room temperature. That's a kind of environment, isn't it? The room temperature. I think if you, 100 years ago or more, if you said, what's room temperature? People would say, I don't know, it fluctuates. I'm, I'm sweating here because it's, it's very hot. Air conditioning, the concept of um, room temperature. Humans designing an environment which is propitious to their comfort and even productivity, because of course this isn't just the home, it's uh, factories, other places. I think the recent UPS strike, the workers said, uh, could you please air condition the trucks? Hmm, sure. Ingenious, and thank you, Mr. Carrier. Who invented it? Willis Carrier. Here's a picture. That's not him down there. It's his worker. The first refrigerating system. These were eventually, you know, put in trucks so you could transport food long distances without it perishing. Notice his dates, uh, 1876 to 1950. So 1876 to World War I was the 50-year uh, period when the capitalist system was most pure in America. Still had a free labor market. Uh, no Federal Reserve, no income tax, no antitrust laws, no regulatory agencies, no welfare state. An enormous expansion of industrial uh, prowess and uh, air conditioning. Isn't this an environment? If I took away the air conditioning, if I took away the building, if I took away your clothes, and I took away your seat, you'd be sitting in the mud or the grass or whatever it is under us. So this itself is an environment. And thank you, Francis Nash. Why do I thank Nash? Because he's the source of Nashville. He was an American uh, Revolutionary War general. And if you look it up, it's from North Carolina, by the way. It's from my hometown, Hillsboro, North Carolina. But that is what Nashville is named after. See, he has an interesting history. Thank you also, Mr. Marriott, because this is the Marriott. 
hotel chain magnate. And thank you, Cornelius Vanderbilt. So the, the hotel is called the Nashville Marriott Vanderbilt, three men who gave us this wonderful environment, well, plus the existing staff. <coughs> Uh, let's uh, unpack this a little more. Again, focusing on habitat. The first principle is that the environment is not, should not be defined as all that exists apart from mankind. But that is the implication. When we say man is bad for the environment, what they're saying is bad for the things outside Man, the wilderness society, for example, if you look, by wilderness they mean nature untouched by humans. That's their ideal. And by the way, if you have an intrinsic view of value, which is not the objective view, nature has intrinsic value. Value in and of itself, regardless of any valuers, regardless even of animals, let alone humans. So that's premise one, right? And then if premise two is men are unnatural. Men are not, mankind is not part of nature. Then you, the conclusion has to be, men are infecting nature. It has intrinsic value and they're messing it up. And they themselves don't have intrinsic value, so we can sacrifice them to this intrinsic value called the uh, environment. By the way, in the literature it's called existence value. Nature has existence value, but what about human existence? So point two, mankind is part of nature. Not apart from nature, but is part of nature, is part of the, quote, natural world and its environment, however defined. And now, obviously, the next step has, there's something called human nature. So not only are humans natural, but they have a particular nature, unlike other living organisms. We call it human nature. That's another thing you should keep in mind. Humans are bad for nature. Wait a minute, isn't there a, isn't there a human nature? How's that? How does that fit into the, your naturalist argument? And further, mankind's unique nature, we'll say what that is in a minute, but this audience knows, necessitates a unique habitat. Not just any old habitat, but a unique habitat, specific habitat. And the obvious, some environments are going to be inhospitable. They're going to be hostile. They're going to be even lethal uh, to mankind. <clears throat> I don't know if there's a clock ticking somewhere. I want to make sure I'm on time. Okay. Abby will rein me in. Thank you, Abby. Let's focus on this one. Possesses a unique nature. What? Reason, the faculty that perceives and conceptualizes the data from reality, unique to humans. Animals don't have it. Obviously, plants don't have it. Volition, free will. Humans have free will. That's why sometimes they make mistakes. There's no automatic way of knowing reality. There are rules. There's a rule book uh, Aristotle gave us called logic. So that's a unique part of human nature. Purpose, Ayn Rand said that uh, Productive work is the central purpose of our lives. Central, interesting. Not the only purpose of our lives. We're not workaholics, diseased in some way. But it has to be a really important part of your life, out of which comes romance, friendship, other things. Unique to our nature. And self-esteem. Esteeming the self, caring about the self, feeling the self is both capable and worthy of living. That's psychology heavily, but it's a value, an important value to humans. Now, let's skip down to the unique nature, what it necessitates. It necessitates individualism. Only individuals exist. Society is but an aggregation of individuals, but the actual individuating entity is the individual. And when you put an ism, at the back of something. It means a full conceptual treatment of the idea, individualism, the idea that the individual person is supreme, that any other relations they have are secondary and hopefully chosen. 
but uh, they're not to be subordinated to or sacrificed to broader collectives. And the key in getting very abstract here, rights, that humans have rights, rights to life, liberty, property, the pursuit of happiness. And there can be such thing as fake counterfeit rights that aren't really rights. You know, rights to healthcare, education, stuff like that. Rights to alleged rights to what others produce. No, rights being restricted to those where they're, in, they're com compatible with uh, the rights of others. Clearly wealth. I mean, you could live an ascetic existence, a bare subsistence level. Some people can even choose to do that, by the way, within capitalism. You can go live off in the woods in capitalism if you want to. When someone leases you the land or something like that, and live uh, a bare bones existence. Interestingly, when you're under socialism, you can't live a capitalist existence, but you can go the other way. But wealth, uh, most people uh, will say an important uh, necessitating feature. It gives us comfort, it gives us leisure, it gives us health and wealth, uh, health and uh, longevity. And then the system, capitalism, which I'll talk about more. Capitalism is the unique habitat unique to humans and human nature. But I'll elaborate on that further. What about inhospitable environments? The record is clear. The dark ages are called dark for a reason. Think of North Korea, but all over the globe. Dark in the sense of reason under assault. Dark in the sense of an afterlife as the primary, not this life. Dark in the sense of being ascetic prize suffering above joy, be a celibate, be chaste, uh, chaste, uh, sex is dirty. Um, collectivism, I mean collectivism does go back to Plato, but the modern form of it is the collectivist states of the Soviet Union, China, Cuba, and elsewhere in the, in the 20th century. And statism, which I'll elaborate on a little bit, state the state as primary. Not just the collective, you know, you can have collectivism where it's not a state, but it's a collective and it still mandates, um, you know, sacrifice of the members of the group. But state is when you wed that to government mandating it. Uniquely inhospitable. I mean, just read Rummel, R-U-M-M-E-L, 1994. The book is called Death by Government. Very stark, very straightforward. <laughs> And uh, using the archives that had been released from the Soviet Union three years earlier, and uh, chapter and verse and full metrics and data on all the people that have been killed under communist regimes since 1917, it was about 120 million. And the biggest killer was China, Mao. Mao's China. So he documents it. It's on record. Nobody can dispute it. Uh, it was real socialism. <laughs> the mock debates of a couple days ago. Uh, the Black Book of Communism is another one from Harvard University, 1999, another thick documentation of how governments kill people. But governments of a particular kind, statist governments, anti-capitalist, avowedly anti-capitalist governments, clearly inhospitable. And not just depriving people of sustenance, forced famines and things like that, but uh, imperialist wars and other things that kill people. Now notice in this, this is her definition, uh, Ayn Rand's definition in the 1967 book, notice how it captures some of the things I've been talking about. She says, capitalism is a social system based on the recognition of individual rights, including property rights in which all property is privately owned, unquote. First thing, first thing I want to stress is social system. I don't think we pay enough attention to this. Why didn't she say economic system? Why didn't she say political system? Social is the broader context, I think, the broader concept. Within our society, within a social system, we have not only families, businesses, but also government and, and other institutions. So her suggestion here, capitalism isn't just about Wall Street, where I had to... I, Picture her on Wall Street, I love this picture. There she is on Wall Street. Right behind her is, right over her left shoulder is who? Do you know? George Washington. What a great picture. So that's in front of the federal building. But that is Wall Street. I also like the picture because right across the street, I used to work, I used to work 
at uh, 48 Wall Street at the Bank of New York, founded by Alexander Hamilton. Lots of interesting history. Capitalism, or, or she says, it is the basic, now get this now, metaphysical fact of man's nature. That's what I'm stressing, man's nature. It's the connection between his survival and his use of reason that capitalism recognizes and protects. In a capitalist society, all human relationships are voluntary. Men are free to cooperate or not, deal with one or not, as their own individual judgments, convictions, and interests dictate. They can deal with one another only in terms and by means of reason, by means of discussion, persuasion, and contractual agreement by voluntary choice to mutual benefit. But this is also very apropos, and more actually more directly apropos to my talk. Man is the only, this is from the New Intellectual, for the New Intellectual, 1961, Man is the only living species who must perceive reality, which means to be conscious by choice. That's my point about volition. So reason, but also volition. But he shares with other species the penalty of unconsciousness. Destruction. For an animal, the question of survival is primarily physical. You know, they have instincts and stuff, which we do not. For man, primarily epistemological, reason. Now this one I love. Man's unique reward, however, is that while animals survive by adjusting themselves to their background, man survives by adjusting his background to himself. That's what this room is. All these materials existed somewhere else at some point. And brilliant profit-seeking people gathered them all together so we could sit here in comfort. <sighs> animals don't do that. If a drought strikes them, animals perish. Man builds irrigation canals. If a flood uh, strikes them, animals perish. Man builds dams. And if a carnivorous pack attacks them, animals perish. Man writes the Constitution of the United States. I love that. Now notice, uh, just as a quick aside, this structure of living organisms, plant, animal, human. A human, oh, go the other way, a plant cannot become an animal or act like one. You know, mobile, looking for resources. Hey, I have a drought here. I think as a tree, I'll move over to, to there where there's a, and an animal can't become a human. But the other way is possible, tragically. Humans can become animals. Some of them can become plants, living a vegetative existence. Do they call it couch potato for, <laughs> for a reason? Yeah. Interesting. So these lower species are kind of too bad, glass ceiling, can't rise up and become us. <laughs> but we can go the other way. We can act in the animalist fashion. Range of the moment, reason out the door, physical, dog eat dog, literally dog eat dog. Not what humans do, but what dogs do. Actually, dogs don't even do that. I think this is actually in your packet. So I gave you this, it's at the back of your handout. I wrote this uh, about four or five years ago. Mostly because I've been repeatedly asked, this capitalism thing, isn't it just for capitalists? You're advocating this system. It sounds like a system that benefits some subgroup because a capitalist is a, you know, a Wall Street banker or the owner of the means of production. And you know that Ayn Rand titled her book Capitalism, The Unknown Ideal. So she didn't shy away from the word, nor, nor in her, her ethics, right? The virtue of selfishness. I mean, she was a very much in your face type approach to these terms, but for a very good reason you know, um, challenge the underlying premises. So what about here though? It does sound like a system of the subgroup. And that's where you get things, by the way, like crony capitalism. Why don't they call it crony socialism? When there are oligarchs who, you know, pull the strings of power in places like Ukraine and elsewhere, they don't call them uh, crony socialists. Or in Russia, but where they are. 
but crony capitalists. So people wed, wed the two, you know. If there's cronyism, it must be due to these capitalists. We got this uh, when David Kelly and I were talking the other day about egalitarianism, the charge that, well, when inequality rises, democracy becomes plutocracy. Rule by the people becomes rule by the wealthy. They're just gonna take over, bribe, take over the government. It led me to look at the word the etymology is just uh, the exploration of the origins of the word, and I found something I did not know. I learned this four or five years ago. It's based on caput, the Latin for head. And the word itself wasn't coined until 1850. That's pretty recent. The word capitalism wasn't even used by Adam Smith, the great free market founder of political economy in 1776, not even by Marx. Marx, who wrote the Communist Manifesto in 1848, he didn't ever use the word capitalism. He sometimes said the capitalist mode of production. But Louis Blanc, a French socialist, was the first one to use the word capitalism in a derogatory way. 1850. So this essay you might enjoy goes through the history of the word, how it was used, the various famous books that started using it. And if you did a chart of it, it just takes off after um, the turn of the century. There's not much, there's a little bit of it in the 1880s and 70s, but um, so both the word itself, but the idea, there were words like capital, that was ways to create wealth, they were assets, and then capitalist was the owner of these things. But as on all things, when you have an ism, it means a broader ideological conception of what the heck is going on. But what I try to stress here, I'll just summarize two paragraphs. Ayn Rand argued that reason is our main means of survival, that brains and not brawn are the primary source of wealth creation and flourishing. She demonstrated why human intelligence and productive prowess must be free if they're to function properly. But then at the end I say, the etymology of capitalism, the origin of the word, integrates seamlessly with the system um, to which the term refers. Capitalism is a system that respects the mind, frees the mind, is based on the mind, is driven by the mind, the head. There's no better name for the system of the mind than capitalism. So don't be shy about using the word capitalism and try to remember the root and relate it to Ayn Rand's point about, that's what I meant about the headgear, by the way, the football helmets the space helmets, the head. By the way, all sorts of words. Cap, the baseball cap. Capital of a city, head of a, capital of a country, head of the country. Even chapter and chef have their origins in heads of things. Captain of a team, decapitation. <laughs> you get the idea. This is from this. I think you got Pocket Guide to Capitalism in your handout, so this is on page... Uh, I forget what page. Here's I call the pillars, I'll go through these quickly, the pillars of capitalism and then corresponding pillars, if you want to say, of its opposite. Now I use the broader term statism, but that incorporates all forms of it, fascism, socialism, communism. But working from the bottom, you could see how it's more philosophical at the bottom and more political at the top. So truly in the sense of roots that the roots of capitalism are reason and objectivity. That's in epistemology, that's how our minds work, that's our unique faculty. Next from that, we must be egoists, we must be self-interested, but wedded with reason, we must be rationally selfish, not arbitrary about it. This leads to us prizing individualism. We are the ones with reason and rational egoism. That itself is an individualist ethic. It starts becoming more social with individualism stressing. How do we relate to others? How do we relate in society based on reason and rational egoism? And then rights. Rights are very egoistic. There's a great chapter in uh, Tara Smith's book on moral and political freedom. Uh, the egoism of rights. Chapter two, the egoism of rights. Yeah, it's a right to my life, my liberty, my property, the pursuit of my happiness. That's all implied in there. Very egoistic. And, and if you undermine egoism, you get people feeling guilty about, my life is not really my own. 
And then constitutionalism, I just use broadly as the form of government that's constituted in a way that protects these things, that protects all below rights, uh, reason, and otherwise. And there are corresponding evils under statism. Instead of constitutionalism, you're going to get authoritarianism. Instead of rights, you're going to get duties. Instead of private property, you're going to get public ownership and control. Collectivism, altruism down below. Subjectivity, not reason. <coughs> That's why she's kind of saying the pillars here. I'm not primarily an advocate of capitalism, she says, but of egoism. And I'm not primarily an advocate of egoism, but of reason. If one recognizes the supremacy of reason and implies it consistently, all the rest follows. Yeah, that's my point here. If you follow reason consistently, all the rest follows up to capitalism. Now, I think this might be helpful. It's a little technical, a little too much for the morning, but a simple two-by-two two matrix of how to classify the four most famous systems including capitalism. What do I have? Ownership and control. By the way, this would not really be doubted by even a socialist. They, they want public ownership of the means of production. But they say that, right? Abolish private ownership of the means. So I've put two axes, ownership and control. And notice I'm here saying, let's think more broadly. It's not just factories and typical means of production like land, labor, and capital. Let's include human beings, the, your body, your mind, you know. This claim, my body, my choice, you know, it's my property, I own myself, so let's include that in here. Well, what a public ownership of bodies, what does that mean? Uh, slavery. Capitalism is the only system that has private ownership and private control. You get to own it and control it. If you go to the diagonal opposite, socialism is public ownership and public control. The commissars, the central planners are going to control it, but they also own it. Now, there are, this is helpful because there's hybrids. Fascism is a hybrid. It is in uh, nominally private ownership. Okay, you get to keep your stuff. You get to hold title to the factory. That's what fascism was set up to be. That's why it's called corporatism. You get to keep your corporation, but we're going to tell you what to do. We're going to tell you what to produce, how much, maybe tanks, maybe munitions. So the fascist model... Mussolini, Hitler, had this. And by the way, the communists would complain that the fascists are capitalists. Why? Because they allow private ownership. <laughs> Silly. Feudalism I won't spend much time on, but it literally is in that quarter. Uh, you have some private control. The peasant could control somewhat, but didn't own the land. The manor owned the land. Anyway, um, whoops. How do I get out of that? Hmm? Yeah. Oh, it just happens on its own. <laughs> Technology. The AI in there is saying, stupid presenter doesn't know. Um, one way of interpreting this, by the way, is we are moving from capitalism to fascism. Because even Bernie Sanders doesn't say nationalize industry. And Elizabeth Warren. Right? They're advocating for more controls. So, you know, just how you can use this, it's, it's, that's fascism, actually. Now, if China goes from socialism to, you know, allowing more uh, ownership, they're, they're, they might be moving toward capitalism, but they might be moving there, which means the two systems are converging in some way, possibly. Well, this chart has been shown before, but I wanted to show you, and this is per capita GDP, how amazing it's grown. But sometimes this has just collapsed into one line, which is actually kind of improper because it doesn't distinguish the more or less capitalist countries in the mix. So, so some of these, I got, I got China, Brazil, Mexico, Argentina here. Uh, so they do spectacularly well the more capitalist they are. You can even, if you look closely at this, detect Germany and Japan plummeting during the wars. And by the way, around Adam Smith's time, if you look closely, the ones that are pretty much the same bunched together here, the United States, Germany, Mexico, and I forget the other. So per capita income, Mexico and the US were identical around the time that Adam Smith wrote. Mexico is much lower now. That's its productive prowess. Here's its capacity to obliterate 
poverty. And again, one line masks a lot. This mostly happened in the more capitalist regimes. Did you see that? I went by too quickly. Did you see that? My God. No, I don't believe in gods. I don't, not my God. 1820, 90% of the world was living in extreme poverty. Just go to the data source, you'll see how that's defined. It's very objectively defined. That's only 10% now. It's largely due to reason, liberty to the extent it existed, capitalism, industry, all the things that anti-capitalists hate. But they're humanitarians and they want to abolish poverty. Okay, I'll finish up now. I, uh, for I think going on five years now, have had a delight in teaching a, conducting a seminar at Duke for freshmen. And seminars at Duke are maxed at 18 students around a conference table. So it's a discussion. And it's called Capitalism For and Against. And half the readings are anti-capitalist, including the manifesto. I joke to students, I apparently am the only Duke professor that still teaches the Communist Manifesto at Duke. <laughs> That's true, actually. Nobody else does. And by the way, when they read it, the normal reaction is, that's it? What? what? Unbelievable. Half the thing is extolling the productive prowess of capitalism. <laughs> Students are like, what? this is the critique of... And the other half is pro-capitalist stuff. So it includes Locke, Mises, Rand, Hazlitt, um, Nozick. But the thing I give them, I give them a handout ahead of time, because we're going through the pro-capitalist side, the anti-capitalist side, so the anti-capitalist, the socialists, the, the fascists, the Keynesians, environmentalism, feminism. And uh, the pro, I cover libertarianism, objectivism, and conservatism. They have different ways of advocating capitalism, for good or ill. But I ask them to categorize it as, are these groups saying it's moral? It's practical and it's sustainable. Well, you can imagine there's a mix. Marx said it was practical. It produced the goods. He admitted that. Sustainable? What did Marx say? Not sustainable. Why? Inevitably will fall apart. Why? Revolution. The workers are pissed off. We've been exploited long enough. It doesn't survive. It inevitably will go to socialism. But even there are libertarians who believe it's not sustainable. Robert Nozick, famously at Harvard, who wrote a great defense of liberty and anarchy state and utopia in 1974, had a view that capitalism was not sustainable. It was somewhat Joseph Schumpeter's view as well, a pro-capitalist. And their view was the intellectual class would bring it down. So, but it's capitalism's fault. Capitalism creates leisure, creates a professor, prof, professoriate class uh, which necessarily hates the capitalists out of envy or inferiority complexes or various other things. So, so they're regretting on the right, uh, Schumpeter, Nozick, and others, they regret that, uh, sorry, it's uh, not sustainable. I wish it were sustainable, but it's not. Ayn Rand is unique. On every course, she says it's moral, it's practical, and it's sustainable. By the way, I left out the environmentalist. Do they think it's sustainable? No, this system is eating up the planet. It's going to fry us or overcool us, global warming, global warming. So, so many, the, the sustainability part's interesting because that's part of the discussion. Well, this is also from uh, my book and the way I put it, I think this is in the preface, that uh, my argument can be stated succinctly. Capitalism is the only legitimate habitat for humanity. Now get this, because I'm going backwards. It's sustainable because it's practical. But it's practical because it's moral. And further, <laughs> these are very disputable to some people. And it's moral because it's egoistic. Mm. Mm. And egoistic because rational. See me going down the list of pillars? In other words, consonant with human nature. No argument for capitalism that lacks these crucial elements or deny their logical dependency can withstand scrutiny or win the day. <clears throat> That's it. That's my talk, and thank you for attending.
And I'll take questions now. Thank you. This, by the way, um, thank you, Atlas Society. This is my own personal website if you want to visit it. This is me doing Instagram takeovers. One minute answers, which are damn hard to do. I look at these for like a half an hour and I'm like, how can I answer that in 60 seconds and, and keep changing my shirt and cat tie? Because I can't look this, should I shave this time or not? They have to look different. And we do clubhouses, I love doing clubhouse. Morals and Markets, there's the pocket guy. I think there's still some of my books there in the back. I'll sign them if you want. I'll sign some after the break, after we break. Okay. Awesome, awesome. And you can find all of these, you know, the clubhouses, the Instagram takeovers, the podcast, are all on the Atlas Society's website. So be sure to check it out on Atlas Society. Thank, thank, thank you, Dr. Sullivan. Sullivan. Awesome. awesome. So in today's uh, mixed economy, uh, we have uh, uh, sectors of the economy that are freer than others. For example, um, like tech, it, you can found a tech company with very little government, without getting government permission, co compared to like sectors of the economy like finance, finance and healthcare, which are heavily reg regimented and all kinds of rules and regulations. So um, I wanted to ask your opinion, like if if you were an employee or a um, entrepreneur, entrepreneur and want, want to break working or want to break new ground in those, hip, those regulated industries, how could we, what could we have done to free them up? That's a good question. The first thing I want to say, by the way, is if you're not at that level, if you're not at the senior level or the entrepreneurial creative level, if you're an employee level, especially if you're an introductory employee, my advice, especially to students and others who are starting up, my advice is if you love some industry, do not use that as a criteria. For example, when I got out of school, I went to banking on Wall Street. Now, I knew banking was heavily regulated at the time, but I loved banking. So that, that wasn't going to make me say, geez, I think I'll be a farmer uh, because uh, it's freer than. Uh, but on that level, yes, if you're trying to start something, start a company, uh, be free, yeah, you probably, but you've got to wet it with your values if you want to be in Silicon Valley. But then, yes, the, sub, the next step would be I need to find the freest pockets uh, I can. But the other thing would be even whatever the regulatory scheme is or the freedom you have, be an advocate. Be an intellectual and a business person, you know, or if you're in the arts, be, be an artist and be aware of your broader context and argue for greater freedom would be my, uh, would be my advice. You. You're welcome. Hi, Brent. Good morning, Professor. Good morning. Wonderful talk. Oh, uh, thank you. Question for you is, it seems to me that if Marx were alive today and looked at what has been done in his name, he'd say, I don't recognize any of this. I didn't write about this. It's not what I meant. But if you looked at the United States, you might say, ah, this looks familiar, because it seems that we are moving on the path that he said was, was determinist. And I'm just wondering, it seems though that he might have had a couple things wrong. He might have had, uh, been confused about how much man might enjoy the violent part of the transition, and he might have been wrong about our nature. In other words, perhaps he should have read Hobbes and anticipated Freud. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts are about is Marx right about the inevitable movement away from free market towards collectivism? And if so, did he get anything wrong? What do we do to reverse it? Yeah, he got many things wrong, but on the inev inevitability part, any social scientist who says any kind of human endeavor is inevitable is uh, fundamentally questioning what attribute? Uh, volition, right, free will. So uh, on that alone, he just got the wrong premise. You know, the things are, by the way, his inevitable chain, feudalism, capitalism, socialism, uh, it just stopped at socialism. Conveniently, uh, nothing comes after uh, socialism. Although someone described it from the Soviet Union once as, the sequence was feudalism, capitalism, socialism, alcoholism. So that, that <laughs> it did, it did, have a, did have a further extension that wasn't, uh, but no, I think if Marx were honest, he isn't. Even when he died in 1883, that's about 40 years after the manifesto, him and Engels were looking around saying, my God, the workers are uh, improving in their living standards. Real wages are going up in the United States and UK. Uh, they didn't drop their theory. Uh, they moved to evolutionary socialism, not revolutionary, not revolution by bullets, but ballots. That's why they switched, by the way, to democratic socialism. That's why the Brits came up with the idea of evolutionary socialism. We'll do it gradually. We'll have people vote for it and vote for the welfare state. Um, so that's kind of how the transition went, but much more could be said. 
against Marx, but I'll save that for another time. I am loudly applauding your approach. Okay. I have never been comfortable with the word. The so, no. Oh. The so, the right, and even our founders' arguments from our founders mm. are basing rights mm. on God-given. Right. And they do. if one is not theological, right, it undercuts their underpinnings, and there's not been a good way to talk about it. Right. But I was exposed to Maslow's ideas long, long ago, and they seem valid. And to approach it from the requisites of human nature, yeah. what do we require, is a much more rational, fact-based, basis, and I could leave out rights entirely. It's just, what does human nature require? The quotes you gave us were admirable, but they are on a theoretical, very yes. broad level. Agreed. Yes. I first heard... Although well, they're concretized by things like light, liberty, property, but there's some concretization. But the way. psychological aspects, yep. right. Eric Daniels, referred to this briefly a year ago in a talk toward the end. And I went, bingo, you've got to write the book to come at socio-political economic organization from the psychological end of what do humans need to flourish. And um, Question? I challenged him to write a book, and I would like, okay. uh, uh, which is, is on the get around to it list, he said, so I would okay like to extend the same, ah. approaching from the avenue of psychology, okay. and if you want a psychologist to work with, okay. her name is Joyce Shulman, and she'd like to do it. So I have a book project I've been assigned. Thank you, Linda. <laughs> there is a small section. I'm kind of proud of it, because I don't think it's been done before. There is a small section, there's a chapter in here, uh, the psychology of capitalism. And so, you know, my theme of social is broader than just, you know, economic. So the sections are the politics of capitalism, the economics of capitalism, the morality of capitalism. But I decided to put something in called the psychology of capitalism. And I think it's very important, I've talked to some of you about it in private, that uh, certain people are uncomfortable under capitalism. So even if you get the economics and the politics and the morals right, some people are psychologically nervous, phobic about why? It's a dynamic system. You have, since you have a you have to make choices. Yes, you can buy insurance, but there's no social safety net. There's no nanny state. You're, you're supposed to be a grown adult. You're not a large infant. So there are psychological requirements of a free society, which will bring it down if people aren't psychologically healthy. The question is whether capitalism promotes psychological health. There's lots of critiques out there that say capitalism makes us crazy. We're, 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 we're affluenza, did you ever hear that? Not influenza, affluenza is a preoccupation with being wealthy. That's a disease to some of these people. Or the tyranny of convenience. <laughs> it's the title of a book. But capitalism definitely promotes mental health and is based on mental health. So that's, read that chapter, that's the closest thing, Linda, to what I'm doing on it. You're welcome. Last two. Yeah, I have, if I have you right, uh, I have seen this phenomenon of we should not have work as the central purpose of our life, but leisure. It's a very common uh, theme among the young. Uh, now, um, if this is just an issue of, of the young uh, not yet figuring out what they want to do and delaying it a little bit, that, that's uh, understandable. But I think it is a fundamental flaw to say, I'm going to place leisure and, I don't know, friendship and, uh, I don't know, Instagram <laughs> above working for a living. I often thought working for a living is a great phrase because it's living. You're not really truly living unless you're self-sustaining. So a person who doesn't have productive uh, 
uh, work at the central core of their life also, you know, they might be dependent in some way on what, parents? What is this phenomenon of living in my parents' basement? Is that because they don't work? I mean, that's not a human existence. It's a sub-level existence, actually. It's the basement. <laughs> um, or when you're in a cocktail party, you say, what do you do for a living? I love that. That's capitalism. What do you do for a living? What work do you do? for? Why is that a nice opening discussion? Because that's the central core usually of someone. Usually, you know, if they pick the right career. I hope that helps. That's not a very really full answer, but that phenomenon does exist. I think it's a problem. Welcome, good. Ray. Good to see you. And um, I want to ask you on this issue of the psychology that you were just bringing up. Uh, and there's many aspects to the psychology of living under capitalism, but I uh, would love for you to comment a little more on the issue of risk. Yes. Because it seems to me that there are many aspects of the psychology, like the focus on productivity, that is a matter of uh, perspective that might of what makes, seems to make people uncomfortable with capitalism right. is that it seems to impose a lot of risk on the individual. Right. And that's not necessarily that there's risks involved in other systems, but it makes it more clear yeah. that your life is up to you and the yeah. risks involved in life are your own to face. Yeah. And that people feel that people get ahead and they worry about the risks and the guilt that would be involved in their lives. If things were to not work out, then the fault is theirs, and they, they, there isn't necessarily anything backing them, backing them up. So thoughts on how, how central is that? Yeah, that's a, what can be done that's a good question. OK, uh, it's a very good question. OK, the first thing is um, risk is not unique to capitalism. Uh, there's nothing riskier than to be an authoritarian, impoverished country. <laughs> you know, with no healthcare system. I mean, you're in danger all the time. Uh, second point, capitalism has things like, and by the way, profit-seeking things, insurance, uh, where you buy risk reduction <laughs> methods, you know, so, but risk is a function of the fact, or related to the fact, humans are not omniscient. They're fallible, they can make mistakes, but what is capitalism enshrining? Use your reason, use your experience, learn about what the risks are. Take what's called calculated risks. You ever hear that, right? What is calculated? Rational risk. What would be uh, terrible, and what we're actually seeing today, because we're moving away from capitalism, is uh, non-calculated risk, phobic risk, something called the precautionary principle, if you've heard this. You know, we're usually precautionary. No, we're usually cautionary. But what is precautionary? It is what you saw during COVID. It is, I'm not going outside. Because uh, the risk of, this is not due to capitalism. This is due to a psychological a defect in a peoples who have abandoned reason, mostly, and have gone by fear. You know, there are three ways of controlling people broadly, by physical force, that's what the tyrant does, but also by guilt, guilt of people will regulate and restrict themselves, but then also by fear. Scare the hell out of people, phobic. Phobic is not just fear. If you look it up, phobic is irrational fear. Um, so fear is sometimes legitimate because we're scared of what we're going to do, but it's the essence of risk, take, risk taking and basically risk mitigating is a big part of capitalism as well. Wasn't it Midas Mulligan in the book, the famous banker in Atlas, who said, uh, they think I'm rich because I'm a gambler. And they'll never be rich because what I do is not actually gambling. Yes, it's calculated uh, risk taking. Another, yes, hi. Hi, I have a question that seems to me you had the nice two by two table about yeah. fall and. Uh, yeah. Or, I guess the thing that feels most unsustainable today, and I just wanted to comment, was the, the way control was going. Yes. Controls, and, and I came through a lot of presentations, presentations about Israel. Yeah. You know, control of the four, the four idiots, and <laughs> the, the, the climate is just four, four men, and how. It feels like control is going more and more to weaker and weaker people that have more and more control over things. Less and less Hank Bearded types and more and more. Yeah, that's interesting. That, that, that's interesting. 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 That's interes
this, this uh, issue of the experts. Well, if they're experts, maybe that would be okay. Maybe they'll control well. But uh, one of the great things Hayek ever did, Hayek, Friedrich Hayek in uh, The Road to Serfdom, uh, one of the chapters is why the worst get to the top. Something like that. And it's fascinating. It's fascinating because, yeah, under capitalism, the best people get to the top. And of course, then they're resented and envied and hated if the psychology of the country is bad. But his principle of the worst that get to the top, which I think uh, Ayn Rand and objectivism would endorse, is if you have a system whose basis is collectivism and exploiting humans and sacrificing, I mean, you're going to get the worst kind of animalistic humans running things. So, you know, like in a free society, you might get a Hitler, uh, but he'd remain a paper hanger. You'd never hear about him. Or he'd be in some thug, uh, you know, uh, bar hall brawl and be in jail. Well, he actually was jailed. That's where he write, wrote Mein Kampf. But he rose up because he wrote, wrote Mein Kampf. So um, if that's the principle you're talking about, yeah, there's this kind of paradox of, well, uh, it's not only they're in control, they're control freaks, meaning they're disturbed. They're sociopaths, they're psychotic. And so um, these characters, what is it, cult of personality is it called? Cult of personality. Lenin, Stalin, Castro, Pol Pot, right? That's not really it, is it? These are sociopaths. It is kind of a cult, but what is a cult? You suspend reason, you believe, you bow down to the dictator, but it's not because they're competent to run your life. Because, well, you get the point. One final question. One. Hey. Yeah. Clearly, socialism is being in a hundreds of viewed as uh, that's noble, and fascism is the ultimate evil. And yet, what we're doing is just playing a semantic game because it is, as you call it, fascistic. Is, do you see a big opportunity in clarifying that line? Because that strikes me as, uh, as, as something that would uh, impact. I think this matrix approach, or the, I, I, I would you know, tell people this is not semantics, real life. And, and death stuff. But I think this uh, model is helpful for debating with people uh, because the terms can get very mixed. And of course, the term fascism is associated with anti Semitism, but there wasn't really anti Semitism or Jew killing in Italy, uh, not really until the end. Uh, so uh, they associated with that as well. David and I, by the way, David Kelly and I did a great thing on anti Semitism and anti capitalism on one of the clubhouses. So the overlap between the two is, I think, is very interesting. But uh, Jay, uh, yeah, I think we, it's, it's a more charged word than socialism. And even the fact that uh, an AOC can get away with democratic socialism. Is there a democratic fascism? Why would that term not go over well? But democratic socialism is okay. So, so they're both murderous regimes. But if you whitewash it with the vote, that's the evolutionary socialism part. And uh, so they would never go for that. So why do we let them get away with democratic socialism? You know, if you vote yourself into tyranny, why is that any better than a, than a coup or a push? The other thing that might be worth stressing is, and this helps us distinguish from corporate uh, cronyism or crony capitalism, they called the Italian version corporatism for a reason. The corporations remained in place, but they were told what to do. Now, here's the other important thing, though. The corporations had to be big. The idea under fascism is you can't have a bunch of small little entrepreneurial companies. First of all, they're harder to control. But if you have like three steel companies and two banks, you know, the dictators can tell them what to do. And they got them in a bind, right? So the move you see today actually toward, you know, bailing out big banks or during COVID leaving the big box stores open but not the small, that's fascist in a way, if you think about it, because it's this idea of corporate capture and the whole woke corporation thing. You know that's happening at the big companies where the CEO suites you know, are right out of Harvard Business School or Wharton or Stanford. It's the, the woke thing is not really at the lower level. Again, a sign that fascism is coming. It's not only a wedding of government with big business, but the, for purpose of control, a better control. Now, if we distinguish ourselves that way, we're not coming out for defending any corporation for whatever the hell they do. 
we're, we're defending, we want independent companies. That's why I've been on a, a, a tirade against stakeholder model instead of shareholder. Shareholder is the owners of the company determine what the company do. Stakeholder, they came up with a stakeholder idea to dilute ownership and say, well, a whole bunch of other groups, special interest groups should tell the corporations what to do. That's fascism. That's you don't own, but you tell the corporations what to do. See how it's fascism? But, but it's a highly charged word. So one of the difficulties is if you're in a debate and someone says something and you say, that's fascist, that's not going to work. But if you bring this kind of stuff in, it might work. Or some of the stuff I said. Is that it? Thank you, everyone. All right. Thank you. Thank you.